Jeff Goh. Oh, thanks, Jeff. Thank you for hosting us here today. One more hand for Jeff. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
the diversity on this block is incredible. And this is existing today. At our center, which we'll go around in a second, we have an effective neighboring in Cleveland study, and we're working with residents on block JR, you see in the middle there, proudly uh, have a hosting this block party, uh, is our resident liaison, and we are going to be working with these residents for the next year before we work with us for that year. So these blocks do exist, but these are few and far, but they exist. Uh, when we have racial equity and inclusion in Cleveland, no one will wear Chief Walker. Everyone remember the Washington Bullets? So that sound strange to the ear? Now, Washington Bullets. For years, I'm going to watch the Bullets game. How do the Bullets do? Cavs play the Bullets. Just doesn't sound right. Can you imagine a moment where Indians doesn't sound right? Can you imagine a moment where we say Indians when we go, wait, we really have a team called the Indians? There was a debate. There probably was a debate about removing the Bullets. But now the bullets is a thing of the past. Uh, let me give you a quick history of team names that are gone the bye-bye. The Dickinson State Savages. And here's the thing, they're now the Dickinson State Blue Hawks. You can still order Savages merchandise. That's that's on a live site. 2017. The Miami University Redskins. The St. John's Redmen, the McGill University Redmen, the Dartmouth Indian, the Siena University Indian, and the Stanford Indians. I didn't know Stanford used to be the Indians. So Stanford and Dartmouth and Siena figured out something that we haven't yet figured out. I will give credit uh, to the executives at the Indians because they are working slowly. I think it's a more incremental process. Um, I think we can do better to say this and recognize that that is an ugly, brutal, racist mascot. And we just need to stop it. Once we get rid of our mascot, guess what comes next? There's an even worse one out there. All right, I digress. Um, we have the councilmen in the house. Uh, we have a real conundrum. And in fact, Councilman Brockatelli, where did you go? Uh, mentioned CDBG dollars. We have a real conundrum. You got this pool of funding from the federal government, and you need to develop the block grants. And we got to decide how to use it. And as Councilman Brockatelli just said, it is a precious discretionary operating resource. And so we, like many, many, many other cities around America, spread it around. A little bit for you, a little bit for you, a little bit for you, a little bit for you. And that seems equal. It makes sense. If I were a councilman, probably get talked into doing the exact same thing. But equality is not equity. <coughs> and spreading CDBG dollars around equally means there might be some places who really could have figured out another way to fill in that small piece that they got, and there's some places who are getting a little piece, but they got a long way to go. It's a conundrum. There's no easy answer. But if we're going to get to racial equity and inclusion, we've got to think really hard about that and how we use those funds. When we have racial equity and inclusion in Cleveland, I will be able to have a primary care physician at the main campus of the Cleveland Clinic, who is black. There will be more than a handful of black doctors. And the black ones that do exist as primary care physicians are in Beachwood and other places. Shouldn't there be black doctors who can be PCPs at the main campus? And I know there are black doctors out there. <laughs> All right, let me bring it closer to home. When we have racial equity inclusion in Cleveland, we will have an 
a percentage of students at our fine institution that more closely mirrors the city that we're in. Well, let's not even city, that's 50%. The county we're in, 30%. Anyone know the proportion of black students at case underrepresented? 4%. 4%. In fact, let me get my numbers. It was five last last year, five hundred five thousand one hundred and fifty uh, undergraduates and two hundred and twenty-six black students. Five hundred and five thousand one hundred and fifty and two hundred and twenty-six black students in the city of Cleveland. And those 226 black students, they don't talk to each other when they pass each other on campus. It's the strangest thing at predominantly white institutions. It's a real puzzle, a real puzzle to me. Uh, and I first experienced it at the University of Chicago. Because that wasn't the way it was in my undergraduate. We would see each other on campus and be like, hey, what's up, what's up? Even if I didn't know you, just nod something. We're in this together. I got to the University of Chicago, and black people just kind of walked past each other on campus without acknowledging us. It was the strangest thing. And came to case, and wondering which one it was going to be, and I'm sorry to report, it's the latter. So I'm a one-man crusade, <laughs> saying hi <laughs> to every student. And it's funny because they uh, have their headphones on now, they're in their phones, so I literally have to like stand up <laughs> and wave to them. And here's the thing. How do you think they react? They're startled and then what? Positive or negative? Someone said negative. How many think positive? How many think negative? It's unfailingly positive. Oh, hi. Oh, I'm good. Hey, ah. Unfailingly positive. So, I don't know. I uh, so let me take close to home. Oh, I'm sorry, I got good news. Uh, I really want to give a positive shout out uh, to Dr. Marilyn Mobley, who's our Vice President for Diversity and Inclusion. Working so, 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 so hard. Uh, I don't know if uh, Dion Brodus is here yet. Dion, are you here? Dion! So Dion Brodus is working on this. Uh, and Julie Green, did Julie make it? There's Julie. Julie is now serving on the board of Clean Energy Project. So these folks are working to make this a different kind of reality. But this is a really proud moment for us. We had a historical marker both on campus uh, just last month to recognize and to capture for all time the history that the university has had in being part of the Underground Railroad in its former location. So this is now on the case campus. You should definitely check it out. All right, we're getting closer to home. The Mandel School. Um, we're doing a little better. Our uh, percentage of African Americans is 27% at the Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences, the social work school on campus. But, before we get too excited, uh, we have realized that we have a serious disparity in our graduation rates. So, folks enter at 25% percent they do not graduate at 27 and so we are dedicating, I'm on our steering committee, we're dedicating every single meeting to talking about that issue and how we be changing. When we have racial equity inclusion in Cleveland, the conversation that I have to have with my son about dealing with the police, which today is literally a life or death conversation. And it's a different conversation, I imagine, than many of the white fathers, probably all of the white fathers, in the room. And I'll choose this one to put on the spot, because one of my sons is actually here today. So, Ayane, you want to get up and just wave to the people, give them a wave, give them a low. So, typical growing eighth grade boy. When I said to him, hey, you want to miss school and come out to this workshop and learn about what your dad does, his response was, what kind of food are they going to have? It's <laughs> <laughs> oh, only true story, you can <laughs> When we have racial equity inclusion, these guys will not fear the game because of how I love them. 
and we will have many, many, many more scenes like this, where our police feel respected, our police feel admired, our police feel that we are grateful, and some of us don't have to feel afraid when we have racial equity and inclusion. When we have racial equity and inclusion, we all win. The police win, we win. When we have racial equity and inclusion, we all win. So you guys ready to get really serious about how we're going to get there? The conversation I want to have with you is not a what if. I don't think Joel, where's Joel? I think Joel invited me to have a what if conversation. I want to have a how-to conversation. Anyone up for a how-to conversation? All right. There are two terms, two <coughs> tools that I want you to burn into your heads this morning and take with you when you leave. You get nothing else out of my talk. Take away these two things. Racial equity lens and racial equity vigilance. Racial equity lens and racial equity vigilance. And I'm going to give you a mnemonic. What's a mnemonic? Let's see how many toughest stories in the world. What's a mnemonic? Lisa Bay. What's a mnemonic? It's a memory tricking yourself to the time. All right, it's a memory trick or memory device. Lisa Behe is the co-chair of the Equity Task Force at Shaker High School. I could not be prouder of the work she's doing. True equity warrior. I want to give you a, a little mnemonic. So two mnemonics, actually, one for each. So these are Adinkra symbols from Ghana. And there actually is an Adinkra symbol for vigilance. It's that. And it's Akobet. And there was not a racial, there was not a particular symbol for lens, or I was thinking discernment, but this is the answer And it's the particular symbol for wisdom, ingenuity, and intelligence. So throughout the presentation, when you see these, you'll know what it's referring to. Ah, so here are the particular symbols in Ghana. There's Professor Mark Chuck. Uh, we were there in May together with a group of students and faculty, and we were making a big product. Banner there. And here are the symbols, Akoben and Nyansopo. Nyansopo's translation is something like a person can find the right way to get a thing done. A person can find the right way to get a thing done. That's what our racial equity lens is going to do for us. It's going to help us find the right way to get a thing done. And I like that kind of open your eyes is also something that a racial equity lens can do for us. All right, so we're equipped. These are our two things. That's it. That's all you've got to walk away with. And you're going to be ready to roll. So let me just say a quick word about my racial equity journey. How am I doing this time? Uh, my, my journey is I'm going to ask each of you, and we've got a bunch of you all signed up for our workshops after this. We're very excited. And we're going to have you all thinking about your racial equity journey. We're going to invite you, if you're not on your racial equity journey, to get on it. And if you're on it, to think about where you are in it. It's a lifelong journey. It's a journey that will never end. My journey has been of an inflection point. Today is a real inflection point for me. I talk about race every single day. Uh, as Ayandi will tell you, we talk about race at our dining table pretty much every night. Um, sadly, I shouldn't speak about race so much. So it's not that I haven't thought about race, talked about race, read about race. Uh, my work, those of you who know it, is on mixed income development, mixed income communities. Uh, and so I think about race a lot in that way. But I usually think about racial integration. And the inflection point for me, I'm committing to you all, is deep diving on racial equity. This is actually my very first talk. I've given probably hundreds of talks. My very first talk ever on race. I've never given a talk on race. So I'm stepping out there with you all. My Cleveland journey uh, has been an incredibly, I'm glad I found such a gorgeous picture because this really reflects how I feel. I've been in Cleveland for 11 years. Uh, I've bided my time. Joel talked about you know, folks who are local, maybe not getting invited, but I think that's been a good thing. 
Cleveland is a place where folks know each other, <laughs> folks want to know who you know, where you're from, and so I wanted to pay my dues. You know, I felt like I had a lot to say for a long time. Do you guys think 11 years was enough time to wait this up in? Can I come out now and say a couple things to you? Um, I have a lot to say. I have a lot I hope to offer and contribute. And I've gotten to offer that in professionally. Uh, many of you in the room, we've worked together. I'm feeling ready to play more of a role, more broadly. And so, this is another inflection moment for me. How can I help? Uh, I think we need to have a city-wide agenda about doing this. I think we need to act as a city. I think we can act as a city. I think that's one of our advantages. We'll talk about it at the lunchtime conversation. We have so many advantages over the rest of the country. So many about getting after this. So uh, my journey is going to another level, and this is a great time because my journey has not been alone. My wife, Maylani, is also here. Let's say hey. I have my wife here is that means I also have my best friend. <laughs> I won't make her way again. <laughs> so uh, we fall in love with Cleveland. We moved here from Chicago, as many of you know. We, we did not look back for a micro. This has been the absolute best place we could have ever thought to raise a family. Much is given, much is expected. We owe a lot uh, to the city. Uh, most of my activism, as Lisa will know, has been in the shape of schools, which is where our kids have been. And so I've been a bit of a troublemaker there. Uh, and uh, how many of you were with uh, Congressman John Lewis uh, a couple weeks ago? Anyone out there? Do you remember what he told us to do? Get into more trouble. <laughs> More trouble. So I'm breaking down the more trouble. Uh, I might be getting in trouble right now. <laughs> All right, uh, I mentioned the center, and we've got folks from the National Initiative. Do you all wave your hands? National Initiative people. Thank you for your help. Thanks for helping the workshop later. Uh, so that's what we do with Case. Uh, we've got projects that just blessed to be working all around the country. So you can see a smattering of our projects, actually, all of our, our facilities we work with. And we get to work right here home. So I already mentioned on the right, you'll see one of our chats on 128. And on the left is, what building is that? That's what building is. Close. Close. The Commodore on Ford and Euclid. Going, undergoing a major mixed income transformation. So we are deeply embedded. Sharice, where are you, Sharice? Sharice is our point person in the Commodore building. Uh, we have reports, we've written a book on Chicago, we do consulting. Okay. About a year and a half ago, Dan Maltrow wrote an article in Political Magazine. And the title I thought was perfect. You might not be able to see it on the board. The title is Cleveland's Race Problem How Long Standing Injustice Could Cripple the City's Rebirth. Cleveland's race problem, how long-standing injustice could cripple the cities we work He just is, says it all right there. So, what's Cleveland's race problem? Uh, we have deep racial inequity. We have deep racial segregation. We were just named in the top five uh, by the magazine. And we have deep racial prejudice. And we really don't know what to do about it, if we're honest. We really don't know. It's so deep and so big. I think we just start kind of moving along for our time here. I, I think we're called upon to do way, way more than that. Uh, there was an article last month in uh, Cleveland.com about our work, because we've gotten some grants. And uh, this is the title. We're going to release that to mixing the bones. So I was perusing the comments. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Jeff? Should, should I peruse the comments? <laughs> Never read the comments. 
never read the comic. Here's the thing. Um, I'm a sociologist. This is a, it's actually a fabulous opportunity to just do a little focus group interview. <coughs> hey folks, what are you thinking out there? Well, they answered. <laughs> Mixed income developments will all inevitably fail when you combine people who have worked hard for their money and are proud of their homes and communities with those that don't pay a dime for their housing, have never had pride in anything. You are asking for failure. Someone else. Yeah, let's see what happens when you put people with nothing to lose. Little pride, wow. Black people are just no pride type people. Or conscience next to hardworking, family oriented people. Oh, so, okay, black people are not family oriented. Interesting. Oh, here's a, a, an erudite person. I'll translate. <laughs> I'll see if they're going to translate the article for us. I'll translate. What this is really saying is, how do we force poor people with no motivation or marketable skills who've been living on welfare for generations into public housing hastily, hastily built? No, not build things hastily, it's built things hastily. In fact, we build them too slowly. Hastily built in nice neighborhoods made up of Man, white people, you guys are so hard-working. <laughs> hard-working, you earn your stuff. Homeowning of citizens, uh oh. That's the word there. Citizens, not just people. So that the parasites. So that the parasites can soak up the bad things. I guess like the mirror, we're all in the together. That's us. You can, you can wave your hand to it if you want. You can say some praises if you want. You can say don't read the comments if you want. I'm sorry. This is America. And this is Cleveland. And this is us. I'm sorry. Debbie Irvin, do yourself a favor if you've not read Debbie Irvin's book. Uh, please get it. Mm -hmm. Debbie Irvin was in her late 40s, I think, when she had an epiphany around race. It's like waking up white and finding myself in a story of race. White woman, privileged background, probably thought a lot like those comments. And here's what Debbie Irvin writes. I've been examining the world through a telephoto lens, zooming in on communities, maybe black people, and individuals. By the way, I'm going to say something. The folks who are looking at the comments saying, well, Mark, they didn't mention race. <laughs> no one said black. Or, Mark, those comments are about class. They're not about race. Those comments were about poor people. Those comments are about culture and behavior. Let's talk about it. Um, and so if you're on all day. So if, you, if that's how you're feeling, and that's totally legitimate, and there probably are half of you in the room who are thinking, that was about race, that was about class, that was about poor people, that was about black people. Uh, let's talk. Please come to one of our workshops. What time are our workshops? At 45 and uh, after. All right. Without putting you should come Racism is, and always has been, the way America has sorted and ranked its people in a bitterly divisive and humanity-robbing system. Humanity-robbing. Parasites, anyone? When you can refer to your fellow human beings as parasites, We have a big day to run. <laughs> Next week. So I went to the mayoral debate at the city club. Okay. Uh, because, now I'll say this, these two men dearly love our city. I have no doubt to the core of my heart. 
that Mayor Jackson and I created love the city. And would dearly love to see us accomplish what we're talking about this morning while we're all here. No doubt. Uh, onto the city club, looking to hear any inkling of something that would be approaching a game plan at a kind of racial equity level. Any inkling, any simmering, and I want to be fair, I want to be fair. So, Councilman Reed said, and I was with Dion, Dion was like, Mark, what are you writing? What are you writing? <laughs> I was taking notes. Okay. Councilman Reed, he did use, um, Mayor Jackson did not use the word race at all. Uh, Councilman Reed did use the word racist, but he was talking about immigration. He was making a point about immigration. He was talking about racist immigration policies, which is fair and important. They are racist, but it wasn't necessarily talking about the issues I've been talking about. And by the way, let me just acknowledge that this is where my own growth on the racial equity journey. My talk to you today, as you've already picked up, is on a black white dimension. Our racial equity challenge is far bigger than that. And in our city, far bigger than that. I'm really proud that Keisha is going to be on our panel to help with that. I'm glad Jeff is here. Help us, right? Those who are working in our Latino and Hispanic communities, um, it's a far broader issue. I have a lot to learn in that regard, too, so I'll own that and we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, so he mentioned racism. Mayor Jackson did say we need to ensure that all enjoy the prosperity of our city. I think it's a great statement, but that's what I'm talking about. Uh, but beyond those two little points like you had, I just didn't hear anything that helps us with what we're talking about. And of course they were talking about crime, of course they were talking about school, of course they were talking about health. But as far as the work I think we need to do, I, I, took, I didn't hear it. So we've got to help. We've got to help. We have to help and share and think and be accountable. Uh, by the way, look at the picture on the right. See if you see anything weird. All right, let me give you a closer look at it. Bam. <laughs> hard, okay, this happens. Hard working white people up there on the wall. What the hell is this? Funny thing with vigilance, when you become vigilant, you start to see things. Yeah. How many times have I been in that room? Look at the people eating lunch. You think any of them looked up and said, What the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> Did you? Yeah. I mean, what the? That's our city club, we're so proud of our city club. Damn, all the business. But I love it, he loves me, he's fine. All right, let's get serious now, how are we on time? Okay, how do we make progress? We gotta start by knowing where we've been. We cannot accept historical illiteracy, I love that term, Dr. Khalil Gibran from Harvard. Historical illiteracy, we are historically illiterate. And it's not by accident, Mary and Mike Edelman, and thanks Amy Morgan another equity warrior speaker who brought this to my attention just last week. Uh, she talks about convenient ignorance. Conveniently ignorant. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's how we... And Amy also with this. Uh, was this Darren Walker who said this, Amy? Or Darren Walker, President of Ford Foundation? We are... Land of Brave, home of amnesia. <laughs> Love that. Folks, we have to acknowledge how we got here. We have to call it out when people say it's behavior, it's culture, it's... I had an Uber driver tell me, um, black folks all want to live together. <laughs> like, it was really, like, no, they this is the white Uber driver. They know they really all want to, that's why they're segregation, because black people want to all live together. Of course, it makes sense, it sounds, yeah. Black people want to live together. That's what, so, you know, a lot of people walking around thinking the reason we're the fifth most segregated city in America is because black people all want to live together. So, we have to have just a basic understanding. I'm not asking you all, and I certainly am not a historian by a stretch. Um, 
But we have to have a basic understanding of America's racial history, which we're not taught in schools, so it's got to change. And the way that today's realities continue to be shaped by that history. That's the point. We're not just learning history to know what happened. It's still playing out today. I'm sorry. Slavery is still playing out today. So let's do a quick history, shall we? Uh, we had 250 years of slavery in this country. We had 100 years of Jim Crow segregation. Really interesting listening and preparing for this. I listened to Brian Stevenson, Tennessee, I've been listening to a bunch of people today. Brian Stevenson and Tennessee Coates both used the same term. They said we've had a 100 year white terrorist campaign. And you see how they pick up this terrorist word, because that's that's, that catches our attention today. We have white terrorism, they would say. I would say, for 100 years between slavery and slavery and the civil rights movement in this country. An ugly, ugly, ugly 100 years ago. And it wasn't that long ago, right? Generation two. So we are living with the ideas of that today. We have a civil rights campaign, and hopefully everyone in this room is a student and read. Um, my favorite is part of the waters. Uh, Taylor Branch, um, David Garrow, Barry Cross. Do yourself a favor. If you have not read a history of one of our proudest moments, um, you should have read it. It gave the many, many, many things. And then we come to the moment we're in now. 1970s to the present. I call it the Advancement Retrenchment Pendulum. Advancement Retrenchment pension. So check it out. Here's our group. LBJ. Nixon. Carter. I know I skipped someone. That's okay. <laughs> Great. Clinton. Water cooler conversation. 
You can't avoid asking yourself, wait, what country am I living in and how did I get here? That should be a good thing for equity warriors. That should be actually a good thing. That's the conversation we want to have. So thank you, Donald Trump, for creating a national conversation about who the hell are we as a country? My wife's going to go, that's never going to be square. That's like, we're supposed to do it in the setting in front of the Fire it up, baby. I'm fired up. Sorry. Uh, these are the questions. Okay, so who is the us? Who is the them? Uh, John Powell, one of our leading race equity words in the country, a professor at Berkeley Haas Institute, talks about belonging and other. Belonging and other. Who belongs? Who feels like they belong? And he says, we have a form of belonging that we practice in America, and his term is, that erases the other. And at a moment where white people feel that there are fewer of the us, and more and more and more of the them, whether it's in some of the neighborhoods that you all are representing today, whether that's in our country as a whole, uh, there is what, what Professor Powell calls a deep racial anxiety. That's our moment. That's the moment we're living in. So other cities are stepping up to the plate. Seattle has uh, a set of new racial and social equity policies. Portland has racial equity goals and strategies. They're naming explicit racial equity goals and strategies. Madison, Wisconsin, the little city, kind of like us, if you were like, ah, this would be more about the area hall, whatever. Um, Madison, Wisconsin, the Department of City. Uh, equity and city policies, budgets, and operations. They got a formal process. Who else we got here? Buffalo. Great out of the way. They have a racial equity routing. And actually, one of my good friends, Greg Hodges, is consulting with that. Baltimore has uh, a set of teams, nine teams, who use this methodology, great food, great food series collaborative. Uh, they're composed of uh, local stakeholders, so nine teams doing this racial equity work. And then St. Louis, another city coming in our in that vein, are part of something funded by the Rockefeller Foundation where they have an equality indicator online data. So, and there are, that's what the Pittsburgh calls it. Other cities are stepping up to do formal equity efforts. Who thinks we should step up and do a formal? Yeah. We're well on our way. We have the year of racial equity awareness led by CNP. I don't know that a city has stepped up and said, we as a city are doing the year of racial equity awareness. I know a bunch of people. What's what our numbers up to you now? 872 folks have been through the Legal Neighbor Progress Racial Equity and Inclusion Workshop. 872, so all over, heading to a thousand people have taken these workshops and said, yes, we want to get more with this. Awesome. So we are well on our way. Let's turn it into something formal and explicit. All right. I think there are three possible pathways to, to racial equity and inclusion. Three pathways. I think all of those other cities are picking the first pathway, which I would call the status quo, which is basically. Uh, you sit and you zag. Kind of that, right? You sit and you get zag and zag. You try some things, they get pulled back. You try some things, you get pulled back. You do on Obamacare, it gets pulled back. Right? It's back and forth. That's kind of how we're making our way through. I think that's basically what they're all doing. Let's try some things, and then the next mayor comes in and says, no, not so much. And then the next mayor comes in and says, yes, we'll do it. And then the next mayor, right? So that's one path, and I think that's probably what we're on. So right now, CNP is hot, we're doing this thing, and then five years from now, Whatever happened to the year of equity of racial equity that we had five years ago? That's really up to us in this room. Literally, we can decide it's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. We will not let this stop. Let's say we can make that decision. The second pathway uh, is kind of a more invigorating, invigorating, risky one, which would be a, some, some kind of social movement. And you've got persuasive social movements like the civil rights movement. 
anti-apartheid movement, and you've got forceful movements. French Revolution. Uh, and I have folks who will say in black community, like, you know, it's actually just going to push it so far that there will be a revolution. I don't know. I think we've got enough video games and TV and movies and things that just keep everyone pacified. Uh, so, thank you for it. But it could be, at some point, uh, those move, they tend to be high intensity, they require a lot of critical mass, and they're leaning, ultimately. It happens, it's a big deal, and then, where are you? One year later. So I suggest instead what I like to call an awareness to vigilance campaign. And the good news is we're already in the awareness part. High five. Now we go to vigilance. Awareness to vigilance. I have in mind something that's deep, that's durable. If you haven't read Frank Patrick Sharkey's book on place, he calls for durable policy. It's got to stand the test of time. Something durable and viral. It's a new, something available to us that wasn't. 50 years ago. What can we do that would be viral and would get to scale in a viral way? So we're in this vigilance campaign and, and the image I like, we're just, just going to drop these down. Before you know it, you cover it right here. Uh, I have in mind exactly what I think Dr. Nazir, she works at Living City, some of you might know her, I haven't met her. Um, even as we are attacking big, seemingly intractable problems like structural race and poverty, Change begins with checking our personal biases. How do we contribute to racial inequities and exclusion, holding our cross-sector partners accountable to doing the same? It requires members of collective impact initiatives, I say we have one of those, to create space to stay in open dialogue, to learn, to understand the world. As each individual <coughs> builds his or her muscle, and that's what we we'll are doing today, if you come to our workshop, we're going to be building your Racial equity vigilance muscle. The cross sector table of partners become stronger collectively and better able to influence systems and their leaders. The domino effect, the ripple effect, the viral effect will ultimately bolster our ability to dismantle structural racism and lay a new, equitable, and inclusive foundation upon which our systems can exist. Beautiful. That just perfectly states what I have in mind. So let me show you what I'm thinking about. We've got these systems. Educational system, health system, community development system, right? We've got all these systems we want to affect, and we've got all of us. What we usually do, is Erica in here, or is Erica? Okay, she leads advocacy work. When all of us are, are doing advocacy work. Usually what we do is we focus on advocacy of the systems. Let's get the school system to work, to change. Let's get the health system to change. And then we hope that it's going to in turn have effects on all of us. Awareness and vigilance campaign goes the other way. It says, let's work on us. And that's exactly what Dr. Nazir just said in that this quote. Let's work on us. Start with you. Where are you on your racial equity journey? Then we, first of all, we're all part of this. We teach in them, we lead in them. We're policemen in them. We're all part of systems. So then we affect the systems, and we still have to do advocacy. I'm not saying we don't need advocacy, we just want to do it. But if we've got this awareness of vigilance, guess who's making the decisions? Guess who's doing the voting? Guess who's doing the hiring? Guess who's setting the policies? People who are thinking a different way. But instead, we focus on the systems and just hope we'll convince them. Let's do the deep work. So we've got people at each of those tables who've been through a racial equity workshop. <laughs> and then the systems do their thing. I think we can win this one. I don't think we can win the other one. I think we'll see some stuff happen and then get pulled away. And happen and then get pulled away. Alright, so here's my theory of change and how this works. There's two levels to it. At the individual level, you become aware. Go to a CSP workshop, that'll get you started. There's a number of other ways to get aware. Then become informed. I was aware and then I was informed. I really became a bit of a student of it. Then allow yourself to be transformed. If you're going to do this, you're, you're going to have to be willing not to be the same person. When you 
come to our regular open equity workshop this, after this, we're going to ask you where you want. And then become vigilant. That's a pathway I would invite each and every one of you to consider getting. Lisa Bay is a very individual. When did you have that? been a long time? Or at least? <laughs> what did that mean? Okay. At the collective level, so there's an individual level, the collective level, we first of all need shared awareness and a common language. That's probably what today is about. How do we talk about this stuff? How are we seeing the same history? How are we understanding the same language? Then, I would submit to you, we need a shared racial equity lens. We need to be looking through our decisions, and our programs, and our policies, and our challenges through the same lens. Then we can take informed action on durable policy and practice, informed by a lens. We're not just doing stuff. We're looking at it like, aha, here's where we're going to convex first. Here's where we're going to put our precious CBD dollars. Then we're going to get some system change, and then we need to do one more thing. We have to protect those systems once we change them. Because someone's going to be coming out. Now here's the good news. We are already doing this thanks to our racial equity workshop. 872 people have a shared language already. Let's keep that going. Today, if you accept what I'm about to show you, we may have the beginnings of a shared racial equity lens. So we're, we could be moving. All right, uh, to build our lens, first of all, we've got to define racism. Hopefully this is one-on-one -on -one for everyone. Interpersonal is racism we often think of, but there are these two massive forms, structural institutional, and then there's a really important one, sneaky, internalized racism. Internalized racism. We are now at the point in America and in our world, 500 years after the first slave, 500 years, that's 15 generations of um, internalizing black inferiority, black as beast, black as parasites. That's deep in here. You can get rid of all the other three and it's still here. So if you don't understand what I'm talking about, please come to our workshop. Please ask somebody. This is really important. All right, let's build our lens. I think that we could build the lens on three things. One, understanding about the structure. Two, an understanding about perception. Three, an understanding about the block. And again, thanks to Professor Powell, who got me as a, as a briefing stuff in the same time. Structure, perception, blocking. That's it. You can remember those three words. You got a racial equity lens. At least you got the beginnings of one that I'll share with you. Ask some questions about structure. Ask some questions about perception. Ask the question about why. What do I mean by all that? Focus on structural causes and solutions. Focus on changing perceptions. Why did you assume that when you saw that black youth? Why? <coughs> and I assumed it too. Why did we assume that? And I'm black, and I assumed it too. Focus on promoting belonging. Not othering. Belonging, not othering. One of our deepest forms of othering right now, obviously, is integration and wall. Um, I want to, you'll be mad, but I've got to thank you for being here. Uh, Pastor John Lentz is here from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. Uh, thank you, sir, for taking your day to be with us. Um, our Chuck and I got here by me from Forest Hill. It is a wonderful. Uh, institution, our community, and you may have read about it as the first what? What's the first little thing? First sanctuary church in Northeast Ohio, giving sanctuary to a family. Wonderful courage, and just sharing this moment with you, John, as I watch you step into a really brave moment. Uh, so thank you for being here. Uh, belonging, or still the same. You belong. I'm not going to let you be othered. All right. Uh, this, if you look at the middle of your table, uh, we handed out the racial equity lens. So you may have grabbed it already. So there is your right favor. 
Who says Dr. Joseph doesn't have a good time? I'll be here to talk to you. Party favorite. You're a party favorite. It's a racial equity letter. And so I'm not going to go through with it. But this is there. We can talk about it. Come on, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Let me end. I'm not going to skip over this. Um, last thing. Racial equity vision. Once you have your lens, I want you to be vigilant about using it. Racial equity vigilance, what does it mean? It means constant self-education. Get yourself on a learning journey. We all have a lot to learn. It means listen more to people different from you. Get out of your echo chamber. Black people, get out of your echo chamber. White people, get out of your echo chamber. Bad Latino people get out of your equity. Listen to people who are different from you. Get a racial equity buddy. I'm sure you might have you've already figured out. It's my racial equity buddy. It's my racial equity buddy right there. And we are going to break. We are. Get a racial equity buddy. Who in here has a racial equity buddy? Excellent. Excellent. Seriously, this is your to do. Think right now. Who are we going to call after this and say, hey, would you be my racial, your Mr. Rogers moment, would you be my racial? <laughs> if you don't know what to do with a racial equity budget, ask me, ask one of the NIMC team, ask one of the Community Innovation Network team. We will tell you what to do with your racial equity budget. John Lennon's point. Are you my racial <laughs> Interrogate your assumptions. Interrogate, interrogate. Don't just question them. Interrogate them. Why do I think this way? Why? And this, I'm not just talking to white people. I am talking to white people. I'm not just talking to white people. I think it's, it's an interesting thing where it's like, I think this anti-racist work is for white people. It's for all of us. We all have it. Lean into the discomfort. Get a tougher skin. Get over yourself. This is going to be uncomfortable. You're going to be offended. You're going to be hurt. You're going to hear something that makes you feel bad. This stuff is bad. But avoiding it, you don't get us anywhere. So lean into discomfort. Lean into it. Like, oh, I'm feeling uncomfortable. Oh, great. I must be using that. <laughs> this feels really icky. Excellent. Build anti-racist muscle. You gotta do this like you're training. Build the muscle. If you don't know what the anti-racist muscle is, talk to somebody, talk to your racial equity buddy. Micro-intentional actions, that means little tiny things. Who do you make eye contact with? I'm making eye contact with you right now. Think about who you look at in meetings. Think about who you look at in meetings. White people, you do not look at us in meetings. <laughs> you don't, you look at each other. Think about just that fleeting moment of eye contact. It's really quick, but it's, it's deep, isn't it, right? Just in a short amount of time. So if, if you can do racial equity work, anti-racist work, in that microsecond, imagine how many people you look at every day. Tens of thousands of glances. Make those anti-racist ones. <clears throat> You're doing work, trust me. Some black person's going to see you looking at them and go, huh, wow. Trust me, trust me, trust me, it's going to make a difference. Teachers, think about who you look at when you ask that question. Why do you look at those same students each time? It's that kind of work we need to do. It is exhausting. I'll grant you that. But it gets easier. You build the muscle, and it becomes intuitive. But at first, it's exhausting, no doubt. I'm, I'm begging you to be willing to be exhausted in building your anti-racist muscle. And please use your racial equity lens. Uh, think about all the different spheres of influence you have. Don't just do this in your workplace. When you're at a CMP racial equity workshop, do it by yourself, with your family, your social networks, on your block, in your neighborhood, in your civic sphere. Think about all your spheres of influence that you could do this with. I'm committing to model, so I got to start doing this, and it's something doing a speech at in your own city with your neighbors. 
because now Miss Vega has been seen at the grocery store in my bar. <laughs> you did not talk to her more quickly. I saw you walk right by her. So I'm going to try to model this, and I ask you to hold me accountable, and I'm going to try and coach those of you who would like to work with us. Uh, we are renaming our center. If we can endow it, when we endow it, it will be the Louis Cynthia Stokes Center for Equity and Inclusion. I'm working with Cordell Stokes, uh, Mayor Stokes' son, and Chuck Stokes, Congressman Stokes' son, to endow in the grandmother's name. Very excited about that. Joel has invited us to be part of a metrics project at CMP with him, <coughs> and I'm going to help end the black graduation disparity in Manhattan. Notice I started with me, but I'm not ending with me. Let's go to CMP. CMP, I would like to see you all. Let's see all the CMP people in the room. Woo! I would like you to declare a year of racial equity vigilance. We've been wondering what came out of the year of racial equity awareness. I propose a year of racial equity vigilance. I propose to take a lens, but that be mine. But I think we're going to be building one together. I'd, love, I'd like you to apply it to all of your operations. Hiring, budgeting, promoting, grant making, whatever, and see what you see. I would like you to help promote individual collective accountability among all of us. We're going to look to you all to hold us accountable. The neighborhood solution grant this year, brilliant. We're focused on racial equity and inclusion. I would like you to prioritize the success of those. I was invited to a judge, there were some wonderful presentations. All of them will need help in doing their work. We have to help them. We cannot just write them a check and then say, let's know what happened in the year. I would like to prioritize the time to help them be successful because they will be the vanguard. I would like you to do what? Oh, uh, initiate the metrics project. And finally, I'd like to consider assessing racial equity and vigilance in your performance reviews. What are in your performance reviews? You're serious about the stuff? You're not serious about the stuff. Alright, we're going to go to that CBC. Any CBCs in the room? <laughs> Community Development Corporations. I would like you to consider applying a racial equity lens to all facets of your work. Alright. And you don't have to use mine up as a starting point. Let's build one together. I would like you to incorporate a racial equity lens in all your proposals. Anyone receiving a proposal is going to hear something about the lens and what it shows. I would like you to coach your residents and your partners on the use of the lens. Have them start doing it. And I'd also like you to consider putting racial equity vigilance in your performance reviews. Let's think about the city. I would love to see our city adopt a formal commitment to an equity initiative. Name it, claim it. I would like to see all city staff exposed to the use of a racial equity lens. If I talk to any city staff and say, what's a racial equity lens? I'd like to say, oh, here's what it is, here's ours, here's how we use it, and here's why. I would like us to assess all city policies and practices using that lens. You see what we see? And I'd also love to see the city put racial equity and vigilance into its performance reviews. I don't know what that means, but I want to work with you all to figure out what would that mean to put racial equity and vigilance into performance All right, that's it. Thank you very, very, very much.